me a moment to adjust things up here. I'm going to work from my MacBook tonight. I don't usually, but I will. All right. I want to thank everybody for the compliments of, on the sermon this morning that I get. I rarely get so many compliments as when somebody else does the preaching. <laughs> there are one or two people who think it's their job to remind me of that, and they usually do. I've been told for a long time preachers need thick hides, and I know why. It's one of the reasons. All right, you should be me. Maybe not. All right. <clears throat> We're going to take a look tonight at the hymn that we just sang. We're marching to Zion. I want us to think about it a little bit. We're going to let it preach to us some tonight. Sometimes it's, it's good to take a look at some of the songs that we sing, to know something about when it was written, who wrote it, maybe the reasons behind it's being written, what the song or hymn was intended to teach or accomplish. Those reasons sometimes lie hidden and we may or may not be aware of them, but it's my opinion that if we can dig into these a little bit, it helps us to appreciate maybe a little more some of the hymns that we sing. I remember uh, it was probably last year that in our All Comers class, we used a, a book by uh, Stan Mitchell. Uh, Brother Stan was professor at Fried Hardeman University. He passed away suddenly just a few years ago. And uh, some years ago, he wrote a, a book about singing. And uh, the title of that book, Give the Winds a Mighty Voice. And in that book, he included a chapter titled, Why Armies Sing. And he told of a time when he was in Zimbabwe, West Africa, and he was in his motel room one day. And he looked out the window to see a large army of 1,000 African soldiers in full dress uniform on the march, singing in perfect four-part harmony, with boots falling in perfect timing with the song that they sung. And he said in that chapter, they sing, armies sing in order to keep step. Rhythm and meter of song enables them to keep time as they march. He said that they sing in order to lift their spirits. To lift their spirits because war and battle are frightening things. And the sound of so many voices blending together reminds them that they're not alone. He said also that they sing in order to tell who they are. And Brother Mitchell said that armies sing to teach. And his point was this, that like a mighty army, we're the people of God and we must march in step. That's one of the reasons we sing. We sing because we need the voices of one another to blend together. Because we're not alone in this fight. The fight of faith, the good fight of faith. We're not alone. We're together. It lifts our spirits and it reminds us of who we are, but more importantly, whose we are. That's what singing does. Our hymn tonight, and I do have a PowerPoint, it's only one slide, and it will include the passages that I will touch on tonight, and that's all it will do. Just give you the key passages that you'll want to look at. 
But our, our hymn tonight, it's, it's not so much an army song, I don't guess, but it is a marching song. We're marching to Zion. And I take the marching here, maybe not as literally, as much as figuratively, in the sense that we're moving forward, we're marching toward Zion, each one of us, even though, you know, any ability that I might have to march is long behind me now. So I like to think that the Lord will accept the spirit of the words of this hymn as I sing them with you, that we are marching to Zion. And, and one thing I know, just like you do, and that is <clears throat> that the impressions of a song precede the expression. In other words, a hymn or a song must make an impression on you before you sing it. Otherwise, your words mean nothing. So the hymn must make an impression on you. You have to understand the words that you're singing. I cannot with heart express to God the sentiments of a hymn that I don't believe or that I don't understand. It has to make an impression on me. So unless I'm impressed with the words that I sing, then I'm, I'm just beating the air. And those who, who don't think of heaven, who don't care about heaven, or who are not looking forward to heaven, cannot sing of marching toward it. Because when you sing, we're marching to Zion, that's what you're talking about. Part of our interest in this hymn or any other hymn is to know a little bit about the person who wrote it. And tonight, our subject is Isaac Watts. Really, our subject is Jesus. But the writer of the hymn, Isaac Watts. Watts lived in a, in a time when churches fought and divided over whether or not to use in their worship services hymns that were written by men or the Psalms of David. And in his time, churches, denominations, if you will, for the most part, just sung the Psalms of David. Basically, that's all they did. But there were those, like Isaac Watts, who wrote a few hymns that were used in worship services. And the uh, opinion of people in that day was not altogether of sweet accord as far as that sort of thing went. So in Isaac Watts' day, there was no sweet accord when it came to using new songs. And by new songs, I mean those that were humanly composed, such as Isaac Watts' songs. Tempers flared, churches split over this musical conflict quite often. And when Isaac Watts wrote in, in this hymn, join in a song with sweet accord, he was preaching to the people of his day because that didn't happen very often. I like to think that it happens a lot now, but then it didn't. Join in a song with sweet accord. In some churches in Isaac Watts' day, a compromise was reached. Old Testament psalms were used at the early part of a worship service. When everybody got there and got settled in and they got started, they would sing the psalms of David. And then later on, toward the end of the service, they would use some of the hymns that were humanly written, such as Isaac Watts' hymns, and that's when people would just get up and leave or not sing at all. So the reaction was fairly strong. And, and Watts said that the main problem as far as singing the Psalms of David 
The main problem was that old covenant themes were being sung by new covenant people. And he said, there are a thousand lines in the book of Psalms not made for the church of our, of our day. And Watts had a point. He had a point that is reflected in Colossians 3.16. You remember Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Now, it's of interest that his new songs were not universally accepted in his day. To us, they're old. But in his day, they were new. And they, they were not universally accepted by people. Just the fact that they were humanly written or composed was enough for most people then to mark and avoid them. That's all they needed. Some objected that, uh, that Isaac Watts was too personal in, in his hymns and songs because he spoke of his own sins and the sins of others. Here's a line that you may remember. How shall the young secure their hearts and guard their lives from sin? Thy word, the choicest rules, imparts to keep the conscience clean. Isaac Watts wrote of sin, his own, and those of young people. And his critics thought that too personal. Isaac Watts wrote of the need of the grace of God in his hymns. And here's another line you might remember. Was it for crimes that I've done that he groaned upon the tree? Amazing pity, grace unknown, and love beyond degree. That's alas and did my Savior bleed by Isaac Watts. He wrote of our sins. He wrote of the need of God's grace. And he departed from a usual practice of the day to try to encourage congregations to sing together. The usual practice of his day, which continued for a long time, really, was that of lining out. The song leader would stand up in front of the congregation. He would sing the first line or so of a hymn. The congregation would follow. The leader would sing another line. The congregation follow. There was no four-part harmony, but Watts wanted people to sing together. No more lining out. Everybody blend their voices together in unison. That was new as far as uh, his time was concerned. And some thought it radical. And others thought it refreshing. The opposition to his hymns is a reminder that, you know, the old songs were once new songs uh, and were viewed with suspicion until people became more familiar with them. And it's the same way today, I guess. Isaac Watts wrote this line in the song that we sang tonight. Come we that love the Lord. And that's thought to have been addressed to his critics who condemned his writing and his hymns. They called it Watts whims is what they called his hymns. So of their criticism, Watts is speaking to them a little bit in the hymn, and he says, come we that love the Lord. And again, some would refuse to sing his hymn when they were new, because they were new. And to those who refused to sing, those who would leave or those who would clam up and not sing at all, Watts said this in what we just sung tonight, let those refuse to sing who never knew our God. But children of the heavenly king may speak their joys abroad. As long as I've sung that song and have uttered that line, I had no idea what Watts was referring to. Now I do. He was referring to the people of his day who refused to sing his songs. Interesting, he's preaching to the people of his day. 
And he might be preaching to some of us, too. This hymn was written and appeared in 1707 under a different title. The title was Heavenly Joy on Earth back then. Today, we use only about four of the original ten stanzas of the song. And the music for it was written in 1869. Some books will say 1867, but I'm not going to argue the point. The hymn itself reflects three passages that I want to get before you tonight. These are the key passages that come to my mind when I think of this hymn. The first one, in Isaiah 35.10. Isaiah 35.10. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. And they shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. The next passage in the New Testament this time in Hebrews 12.22. Hebrews 12.22. But you have come to Mount Zion and to the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to innumerable angels in festal gathering. And the third passage of particular interest is in Psalm 137, verses 1 through 3. And here's what it says. By the waters of Babylon, there we sat down and wept, when we remembered Zion on the pillows or on the willows, there we hung up our lyres and there our captors required of us songs and our tempters mirth saying, sing us one of the songs of Zion. And that's 444 in our hymn book that we used last night. And last night at the singing for the first time, I realized there's a hymn in our book titled Psalm 137. Had no idea. Had never sung it before last night. But now I know it's there. And uh, it not only quotes from Psalm 137, but also Psalm 1914 as well. So in Psalm 137, read it sometime when you have an opportunity. The emphasis is on Zion. The Jews were being taunted by the captors in Babylon. They were being asked to sing the songs of their homeland back in Judah. Those were the songs of Zion. Their hearts simply wouldn't let them do it. Now, moving forward to the New Testament again, coming back to Hebrews 13. In Hebrews 13, we find another group at a time far removed to who we can relate even more. And here it is in Hebrews 13, 12 to 15. So Jesus also suffered outside the gate in order to sanctify the people through his own blood. Therefore, let us go to him outside the camp and bear the reproach of that, that he endured. For here we have no lasting city, but we seek a city that is to come. Through him, then let us continually offer up a sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that, that acknowledge his name. Hebrews 13, 12 through 15. Now, <clears throat> when I read that passage, and I've read it, as you have many times over the years, it addresses singing. Worship of God, worship to God, and the fruit of our lips when we sing. And I'm reminded when I look at that passage in Hebrews 13 that there are certain things we tend to forget. One of those things we tend to forget is that worshipers in New Testament times didn't go to church in order to hear an inspiring sermon or to be uplifted by a wonderful song service 
And I'm not saying that they didn't hear inspiring sermons. Nor am I saying that they didn't experience uplifting song services. I'm saying they didn't go to hear all of that. They went not to receive as much as to give. Why do I say that? Because in Hebrews 13, 12 through 15, here's an offering up of certain things. Offering up a sacrifice of praise to God, the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. So when people go to worship in heart, truly in heart, it's to give rather than to get. So when we come together as we are tonight, I hope that we'll remember, you know, in the New Testament times, they didn't go there to receive as much as they went to offer, to offer themselves, to offer their ears to God's evangelists who preach the word. That's offering. Offer their hearts in dedication, discipleship, and service. That's giving. To offer the sacrifice of praise to God. That is the fruit of lips that acknowledge his name. Now, a funny thing happened on the way to our times. And that funny thing is that people began to attend worship for what they could get out of it rather than what they could put into it. How shall we sing the songs of Zion? Psalm 137. As toward that land of Zion we march, we're marching to Zion. We're marching right now, while here we're marching to Zion. And on the way, singing the songs of Zion. How are we going to do that? We're going to do that as we offer our lives a sacrifice, the, the praise of our lips, and how seriously we take it is described well by the psalmist here in 137 of Psalms. And I'd like for you to notice it because this is what's going to convict us right here. In Psalm 137 and verse 5, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, Zion, heaven, to us, if I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand never again be usable. All right. If I forget Zion, to which I'm marching, may my right hand no longer be usable. If I do not set Zion, heaven, Above my highest joy, I lose the ability to speak of it ever again. Psalm 137, verse 6. I, use, I lose the, right, the use of my right hand. In Brad's case, his left. The ability to even speak of it. And here finally, the hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets, Isaac Watts wrote, before we reach the heavenly fields or walk the golden streets. This song is a reminder of heaven. When we use the word Zion, we think of Jer old Jerusalem, yes. But above all, heaven. Because that's the new Zion to which we're marching. And we're making progress every single day. We're marching to Zion. Beautiful, beautiful Zion. The only way that we're ever going to accomplish that objective or that goal is to get back to the point that was made at the beginning of this lesson. And that's in Stan Mitchell's book, Why Do Armies Sing? We're in an army, or at least we better be, in the Lord's army, soldiers in the cause of Christ, 
marching to Zion, united, together, marching in step, singing. We're blending our hearts, we're blending our lives and our voices together as we march. All right? That's what the church is about. That's why a hymn, a hymn like We're Marching to Zion reminds us of who we are and whose we are and why we're here, okay? I hope this will speak to you tonight. Think about your obligation to march in the Lord's army, to be a part of that army, to engage yourself as a soldier tonight if you're not already. And if you haven't been serious to that task, remember the verses here in Psalm 137, verses 5 and 6, how seriously the task should be taken to march in the Lord's army and sing the songs of Zion. Okay, we'll end there and we'll sing a song to invite you tonight if you need to or respond to the Lord's invitation while we stand, sing to encourage you.